Hi everyone and welcome to Module 6, Lesson 2, Remote Sensing and UAV Collected Data. I know that you all haven't heard from me in a while, but this is Jacob Draper and uh, I'm looking forward to diving into this lesson with you all. So in this presentation I will provide a Green Drone AZ recap, uh, drones as remote sensing tools, and discuss drone collected data. This will be the last presentation Justin and I share with you all, so thanks for participating and hanging in there with us. So we thought it would be appropriate to start this lesson with a general recap of the Green Drone AZ program. This project is the product of a collaboration among our team Ecoculture at NAU, National Forest Foundation, Boeing, Tano National Forest, ASU, and much more. The goal of this project was to create a two-arm approach, one focusing on educational outreach to youth in our community, and one focusing on monitoring the impacts of management related to the Lower Salt River Restoration Project. With regards to our goal of educational outreach, we hope to increase interest and encourage persistence in the field of STEM. We want to inspire you guys to explore the intersection of technology and the environment. We will all need bright thinkers to solve the challenges we face in the future. We share this through our middle and high school educational programs that teach you all about how drone and GIS technology can be used to improve conservation efforts related to the environment. And we strive to do this by sharing the real conservation work we are completing on the Lower Salt River, a water body that's so important to our past, our present, and the future of the Phoenix metropolitan area. In addition to our outreach program for middle and high schools, we also partner with the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University to provide internships for graduate students in the Master of Advanced Studies Geographic Information Systems program. This is a one-year or accelerated master's in GIS program. Each year, these students help assist in our efforts of educational outreach and biological monitoring on the Lower Salt River. In Module 7, you'll meet the interns from this year's program and hear about what they plan to do for their capstone project. As we progress through the program this year, we have shared with you how we utilize drone and GIS technology with regards to the Lower Salt River Restoration Project. These technologies aid in our effort to monitor the effects of management actions and track changes in vegetation populations on the Lower Salt River. Ultimately, this data will help us answer the question, are we seeing a reduction in invasive plants and an increase in the abundance and diversity of native plants? Drones can help reduce human error that occurs during the on-the-ground monitoring while collecting fine resolution imagery that can be returned to for further analysis. But most of all, we wanted to dive into this field to learn just like you are. It is exciting to pave our own path and career and be able to share our results and lessons learned with not only you all, but also our partners as well. As we dive deeper into the drone imagery, it's important to think about how this technology can be implemented into other projects and other areas of interest. We have already discussed the obvious benefits of utilizing drone technology over satellites, such as fine resolution imagery and the ability to increase our temporal resolution. But aside from resolution, what are the other benefits? Let's use your house for example. If you were to go onto Google Earth and search your house, you would have a fairly decent image looking straight down. You could very roughly measure the width of your driveway and even determine the square footage of your lot. Now let's compare that to drone imagery. We could use a drone to collect perpendicular images or nadir images and oblique images or images that are collected at an angle. What we end up with is not just a 3D model, but the ability to look at walls, understory features, or whatever else may not be visible from these perpendicular photos. The resolution will be of a much finer scale and more details will be present. Now there are some challenges when dealing with drones. Some of these include the upfront cost, having certified personnel to operate the aircraft, equipment limitations like batteries and weather conditions, the size of the site, and how to store all of this data. Not only do we need a large 
a storage drive to house all of the photos and project files, but we need the processing power required to render these images within our photogrammetry software. Unfortunately for us, computer technology is advancing faster than software. What I mean by this is we have a tremendous amount of computing power within our computer, but the software can only go so fast. And as a result, we do not end up using all of the computing power and our large data sets still take several days to process. Like we discussed in module two, the size of your site can dictate which drone platform you use. On this slide, you can see the Phantom 4 multispectral on the left and the Wingtra on the right. The Wingtra is also a VTOL, which you might remember from Module 2. In our case, the Phantom 4 multispectral took several days, even up to two weeks, to collect imagery across the site. The Wingtra was able to complete the same flight in about an hour. On the flip side, if we wanted to fly inside of a building or perform a tower or building inspection, the Wingtra might not be the right option. The Wingtra must continue to move to stay in flight and cannot hover like a multi-copter can. It is important to consider these factors when preparing to use drones to complete your task. Throughout the program, you may have wondered why Green Drone uh, was as much about GIS as it was about drones. And that's because we want to share with you the unique opportunity to possess both of these skills. This is not commonplace in the workforce and makes for a highly desirable candidate. There are tons of people out there that can operate drones that have no clue how to do anything with the data they collect. Similarly, there are GIS professionals itching to get their hands onto drone data that don't possess the skills or ability to do so. When it comes to making meaningful data out of drone imagery, there is one more discipline we haven't discussed much that is at work behind the scene. This is photogrammetry. You may have heard either myself or Justin mention this in the past. Photogrammetry is the act of making highly accurate 3D models of features or terrain from 2D photographs. The fundamental principle behind this method is triangulation. Because each drone photo is geotagged, meaning it contains its latitude and longitude coordinate position and altitude, photogrammetry software can use multiple photos of the exact same object to place the point of interest on a subject in an accurate 3D position. The final result can be hundreds of millions of points that come together to form a highly accurate 3D representation called a point cloud. Photogrammetry can also take place from the ground. As you can see here, this is an erosion gully photographed from multiple overlapping angles with a handheld camera. This was actually on the project site and Justin took his camera out and captured a couple hundred images of this gully and was able to render these images into what you see here. But the more commonly and uh, I would say exciting form is imagery collected from an aircraft. I will end this lesson with a discussion on the varying types of data that can be collected or derived from drone imagery with a focus on how we at Green Drone Arizona have used this data to aid in our effort with the Lower Salt River Restoration Project. So point clouds and digital elevation models. The final point cloud product after processing is referred to as a densified point cloud. It is a collection of 3D points containing the X, Y, and Z coordinated information uh, for each point. In this case, Z represents the point's elevation information, while X and Y represent locations such as latitude and longitude coordinates. The point cloud is a crucial first product in the photogrammetry process that is used to create a series of other outputs. Let's first discuss digital elevation models or DEMS. In this case, the point cloud is interpolated as a 2D surface. So it's going from points, think of a point cloud, to pixels or an image. You will recall from past lessons that a collection of pixels organized to represent a continuous data, such as elevation, is referred to as a raster data set. 
One very popular form of a digital elevation model is referred to as a digital surface model or DSM. A DSM captures both natural and artificial features of a surface. DSMs are used in a wide variety of applications to model the surface of an area. As we can see here, the DSM captures all of the above ground features, which in our case for our project site is vegetation. Another popular digital elevation model is a digital terrain model or DTM. A DTM does not include above ground features, which means that we are looking at the raw terrain or elevation change across the site. We have been able to use this model in conjunction with other resources to model uh, water flow events during floods and predict where shallow groundwater may be reached for tree planting. The last digital elevation model I will discuss with you is a canopy height model or CHM. A CHM takes the DSM and subtracts the DTM to model only the above ground features. We can use this model to compute tree canopy data. And once we have you know, several years of data collected, we will even be able to determine uh, canopy growth for individual species across the Lower Salt River. Here is a great graphic from Earth Data Science that displays the differences between the three models, uh, which are all varying forms of digital elevation models. Again, a DSM includes all above ground features, a DTM excludes those above ground features, and a CHM looks at just the above ground features. Moving on from digital elevation models, let's discuss orthomosaics. An orthomosaic is a single image derived by stitching together many individual images. If we break apart the word, we can gain a better understanding. The ortho portion refers to the process of orthorectification, in which the image is geometrically corrected to remove perspective distortion. The DSM is used in the photogrammetry process to do this, meaning true distances are preserved. And highly accurate measurements can be taken from the ortho. The mosaic part refers to the stitching together of many images. In addition to RGB imagery or our visible light imagery, we use a multispectral sensor to collect multispectral imagery. The graphic on this slide shows what each band looks like with our Phantom 4 multispectral, including the live NDVI view. I don't want to get too lost into the weeds here, uh, but in short, NDVI shows where healthy vegetation exists in green and unhealthy vegetation in red. I would encourage you all to check out the link on this slide to get a better understanding of multispectral imagery and the importance of these extra bands of light that we cannot see with the naked eye. Vegetation classification cannot be done with just a few indices. Think of it like you are describing what your house looks like to a friend and they have no phone or anything to help them find their way. Every additional layer of information you provide to your friend will help them determine which house is really yours. Some of the information be, may be your house color, maybe uh, roof color, a single or two story, texture, and, you know, much more. All of these different layers of information will help your friend, and in our case, the computer, make the right decision. By using a workflow like the one that you can see here on the left, we can incorporate all kinds of information, including the indices you saw on the last slide, and run that through a program to classify the vegetation. Everything is taken into account from spectral values to structural data like height and width, and produces a machine-generated classification as seen here on the right. Because a computer does not have the background knowledge that we do, the more information that you can put into the workflow, the better the results will be. We at Green Drone, including our interns and our partners, are constantly working to enhance our workflow so that our results continue to get better and better. Pretty cool, huh? So in the future, we hope to explore change detection, meaning 
you know, are we seeing these native species increase in abundance and how quickly are they increasing in their population? And we also want to model some habitat suitability, you know, so we have a lot of bald eagles here on the Lower Salt River. Um, maybe we can predict which parts of the river um, they might reside in. Uh, so that's what we're looking forward to, to doing in the future. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for you know sticking with us this entire year. I know that we have one more module left, but this is the last of the hard modules, I promise. Um, thanks again for teachers and students for participating. and. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out.